welcome everybody to, I think this is the second of our Can You Dig It online event programs. This one's got a slightly different format. We're trialing it um, and in conversation. Um, but my name's Helen Kerren. I'm the Education and Community Engagement Officer for the Galloway Glens Landscape Partnership Scheme. Um, the Galloway Glens is a five-year heritage lottery funded project that's running from 2018 through to 2023, all about linking people with their natural, cultural and built heritage. Um, and so as part of that, Can You Dig It is, is one of our flagship projects, really. It's a now a three-year community archaeology programme, uh, match funded by Historic Environment Scotland. Very grateful for their support in that. Um, we had a great year last year, those of you who know, with some digs and explorations and training workshops. We're now having to move the, the programme online, obviously, as you'd expect this year, or certainly this summer with the COVID response. But I think there's some opportunities and some upsides as well. And one of those is that we're delighted to have with us today um, Andy Nicholson, the regional archaeologist for Dunfries and Galloway Council. He'll be in conversation today with Tom Rees, who I think maybe a lot of you know, but he's the um, consultant archaeologist for Rathmel Archaeology, who've been delivering Can You Dig It for us. Thank you very much, Helen. So as Helen said, I'm one of the archaeologists on the Can You Dig It team helping to deliver that. So I was delighted by the opportunity to uh, set and pose questions to Andy today about his work and role, partly because I think, Andy, I first uh, uh, made your acquaintance pretty much 30 years ago now, uh, when we met at Peter Hill's excavation in Whithorn, uh, under the Whithorn Trust. Back then, I was a lowly second year undergraduate at Edinburgh, struggling to understand what archaeology was about. Uh, you were part of the team, to my recollection. Now. Uh, I ask this with great caution, but what was that your first stab at archaeology, Andy? No. Um, by the time you met me, I think I had already been engaged in archaeology for some slightly over 15 years at that point. Um, I first started uh, when I was at school as a member of the Young Archaeologists Club through the Council for British Archaeology. And when I was 14 and my careers master asked me what I wanted to do, I quite boldly said that what I wanted to do was to be a county archaeologist. And given the way the rest of my career went, I was genuinely surprised 40 years later to discover I had actually done what I set out to do when I was 14. That's quite remarkable. I believe for those who wish to be uh, uh, appalled, <laughs> uh, I, I have the ability to share images of a, a young lean uh, Andrew Nicholson undertaking work. So uh, wh whereabouts did, did you train? While I was at, still at school, my Latin master suggested to my parents that if I really wanted to go into archaeology, then perhaps I should go and try excavation because a lot of people liked archaeology but found out that when they went digging they really didn't like the mud and the rain and the grime and everything else. So I went off to a training excavation run by Birmingham University's extramural department under Graham Webster and I started excavating on a Roman villa down in the Cotswolds, lovely site and discovered I was absolutely hooked. I went, I went back there for three seasons. I, by, I'd already got three or four months experience in the field before I went to university. I actually ended up going to Birmingham because they offered an intercalated year of um, excavation experience. Mm -hmm. So, um, and while I was at Birmingham, I excavated on sites um, like Wasperton or up in the Orkneys. Um, I'd done some work out in Sweden. I travelled around a fair bit doing archaeology. Um, but I'd also done a lot of work before I went to university with the Northeast of England Archaeology Unit under Peter Clack. And so when I actually graduated, I'd, after I'd finished my finals and before I'd even got the results, um, I got an assistant director post on some excavations in Durham City to go out and head to where I was running one half of the site and Peter was running the other and he was desperately anxious for me to go up there so I actually had to leave my first job to pop back down to Birmingham to go and pick up the degree. That's pretty rare now to, to find yourself able to step out of a university life even before formally graduating. In, in, into your first uh, archaeological 
assistant directorship. So it, it, it is, but at, at the same time, quite a lot of archaeology can also be based on the absolute chance circumstance of who you know, people you've met during your career, um, who people who you know you're happy working with. I mean, Peter Clack was fundamental in turning me into the field archaeologist I am. I, I learned an awful lot, of, not only about actual field craft, but about supervising, about how to run a site, the importance of record keeping and everything. Um, and I, I wouldn't have been the same archaeologist without that. So I, I worked for them for three years, um, including odd little side trips like mm -hmm. excavating in the River Thames down at the Tower of London, the only site I've ever worked on that flooded twice a day as the tide came in, leading to some very challenging excavation. Um, but I worked for there, then I went down to, the opportunity came to work on a major urban site in Bristol for Bristol Museums and Art Gallery. So I went down initially to do that. That was part of the early 80s uh, manpower services scheme. Uh, so we had a complete mixed range of excavators from a wide variety of backgrounds and with a wide variety of abilities. So I was supervising one of the areas on the waterfront and when the first scheme finished, they, the director went off to write up the site and they extended the scheme for a couple more years. So two of the supervisors um, Mike Oxer and myself ended up direct, alternately directing excavations in and around Bristol. And I was just coming to the end of writing up my last excavation in Bristol when some friends of mine who lived in Wigtown told me about the excavations at Whittle. Um, and they knew I was interested in the early medieval period. They said that there were some Viking houses that had been excavated, the first ones found on the Scottish mainland. And they suggested that, that I might want to come up and meet Peter Hill, the excavation director. So I, I came up in, in December of 86, met Peter, we, we had a discussion, we got on well. I was involved in the writing, helping to write up bits from the first season. And then when the second season started in 87, I was supervising the area that's actually shown in your photograph, um, area G in the background. There are no accidents in these photos, Andy. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I know. I can spot myself on the left there. I can see there's no accidents in that. that. Well, I was just that... going to say, is that a pirate? <laughs> <laughs> no, that is my Viking alter ego who is not participating in this particular discussion. Ah, he's mm. looking quite pirate-esque there. But he is busy there explaining things to the public. That's uh, because yeah. one of the things that I was involved in at Whitorn was a whole series of experimental archaeology. In addition to running part of the site, one of the things we did at Whitorn was to reconstruct a Viking house based on the excavated one so that we had something physical to show the public when they came round. And we did experimental metalworking. We do things like taking roadkill and skinning it and using traditional toying techniques in order to turn it into leather or turn it into furs. Um, we did spinning and dyeing and weaving. We did black thatching for the second of the Viking houses that we built down there. So there was a whole series of experimental archaeology programs that were going on in conjunction. Whittorn wasn't just the, the excavation itself. And that very much continues with the Whittorn project today. So now they have the reconstructed roundhouse based on the nearby excavations at Blacklock of Merton. Um, so they've now got, got a roundhouse, which has very appropriately been called the Peter Hill Roundhouse. So the Whitton Trust continue to do ongoing works but, um, and public, um, public activities engaged in this experimental work, which is a continuation of the works we were doing 30 years ago. Yeah, and... Uh... In a hunting around, I actually found uh, one of the original interpretation panels from one of your reconstructions, the original reconstructions. Which the original was, one? Yes, which was which I thought was uh, uh, quite lovely to see that attempt to communicate very much uh, the structures that were being excavated. I would say the reconstruction drawing looks a little bit more stable than the first reconstruction, Andy. The, the drawing is a little more stable than the first reconstruction, which was 
um, was completed, but unfortunately burnt down um, by accident, um, leading to the recon to a second reconstruction, which was considerably more stable. A, a learning experience gradually. That, that's very much what archaeology is. You, you, you interpret it, you test your results, and then you go back um, and you reinterpret the evidence and you look at the evidence again to see if you can produce something that, that might be more viable. And I, I think it is lovely to see the trust there continuing in the tradition of what was started in the 80s of such a comprehensive approach to archaeology and what it means. Oh, that's, that's very much it. And I, I do strongly feel that, that archaeology isn't an ivory tower exercise. It's all of our history. Um, and one of the key things, both at the time at Whittorn and subsequently um, in my work through the council, is that it's not my archaeology. It's the archaeology for the people of Dumfries and Galloway, for the people of Scotland, and to, to a much wider audience. And if we don't actually convey what we find in a way that the public can understand it, then I think we're fundamentally mi missing a large part of our job. Couldn't agree more with you there, Gov. Looking uh, at Whitton, though, your, your involvement with Whitton came, came ultimately to, to an end, and, and I presume you moved on. Uh, where, where did that life take you post Whitton? Oddly enough, post Whittorn, life took me to Whittorn, <laughs> um, but in a different role. After I'd finished working for the Trust, I set up my own private archaeological business, um, and I ran that from Whittorn. One of the primary aims of the business was connected with publishing the um, volume Whittorn and St Ninian, the excavation of a monastic town in which I was responsible for writing up all the reports on all the metal work, on the stone work, things like the antler working and uh, the leather finds and so on. Um, so we had to do a lot of that, but at the same time, there was also field work involvement. Um, when companies are putting uh, pipelines in across the northern end of the Maccas, we would do walkovers and watching briefs ahead of that. Um, when the Landmark Trust were doing work at the Castle of Stair, we had to do, we did a watching brief uh, ahead of the services, being, new services being put in. Um, works in places like New Abbey when BT were put, um, which is a um, considerable medieval abbey site in the region, mm -hmm. um, BT were running series of cables through the, through the middle of the village and we found remnants of medieval bridges and medieval houses under the main street. So, so the, the, there's a large part of still continuing my fieldwork experience, but this time um, working on my own with my own small business and a small number of employees um, under, undertaking works around the region and then subcontracting to wider things. So mm -hmm. um, I was asked by English Heritage to go and do some work on a site in Lincolnshire. And then because I, had, because I was a digger who could dig, but also had a considerable amount of finds experience, I was asked to go and do some works with them at Whitby Abbey, mm -hmm. um, where what the director said he needed was a fine supervisor who could dig who had specialists in early medieval monastic sites. And by chance, I was already doing one call off contract with English Heritage at the time. Um, and my then supervisor got in touch with the office of doing the new project and said, I think I have the ideal candidate for you. <laughs> Which I'm sure they did. <laughs> now, lo looking at that, I mean, that's, that's a rich and developing career path, looking at the commercial environment that was growing rapidly then in the 90s. Uh, you took quite a different step then in 1999 when you uh, took on the assistant archaeologist role with Dumfries and Galloway Council. Quite different then from your background in uh, finds work, excavation, experimental archaeology. What attracted you to that move into the curatorial world? It was partly to do with personal circumstances, mm -hmm. with young boys growing up. Um, the being away from home for three months at a time and only getting home every second weekend 
Um, but also, also it was a chance to look at a different side of things. It was, I had previously been doing work fulfilling planning briefs that had been set um, by the Council's Archaeology Service. And it was an opportunity for me to carry on working within the region, but, but on a much broader basis, so that I could take in a number of sites. It's, it's an amazing region, Dumfries and Galloway. I'd originally only come up here for a six week break. Um, and that, and as I said, that was 1986. Um, so I've been I've been up here for for 33 years and more on my six week break. Um, the archaeology of the whole region is is absolutely stunning, but it's working for the council gave me gave me an opportunity to get a deeper understanding of the landscape of the region. We we have everything from Mesolithic flint scatters along the rivers um, that are uh, some seven and a half, eight thousand years old, through to, as shown on your screen at the moment, World War II um, material like the Ukrainian the prisoner of war chapel um, up over by Lockerbie. So the the depth and breadth of archaeology in Dumfries and Galloway is is absolutely stunning. And it, it has given me the opportunity for years to, to work within the planning department um, to actually help try and preserve the archaeology of the region. You can't preserve everything. That's, that's not what the Council Archaeology Service is about. But it's to try and mitigate impacts that may take place on the, on the environment as a result of development. Um, and, and it gives me the opportunity to still go around um, the region under normal circumstances. We'll make an exception for this year. But to still go around the region look, looking at some, some absolutely stunning sites. And I, I must admit, I, I, for those who don't appreciate, I joined Fife Council in a similar role back in 2003. And I think some of my motivation was very similar at that time. Uh, now, I must admit, when I went into the office for the first time in Fife, uh, I was shown a, a large run of filing cabinets full of reports, generally misordered. Uh, I was given a computer station with software on that no one was trained on and advised that I was now in charge of the sites and monuments record. I, I wonder, coming into the council in Dumfries and Galloway, what, did you have an ex similar experience there, Andy? I, I had an almost exactly parallel experience. Boxes, boxes full of reports, boxes full of unorg not organised slides of sites all over the place, um, and a, a, compu a computer system with a database software that I'd never worked with before. Fortunately, in my post excavation work, I've had experience of working with, done a lot of work with databases, but things like GIS, the Geographical Information Systems, the digital mapping that we're expected to use, the Council's Archaeology Service was one of one of the one of one of the forerunners of actually using GIS mapping systems within the council. We were on the very first sections of the council to adopt it, and it's been absolutely crucial. And no, I um, I was give, given this new software. You can see the a database record for a site on the left there. Um, it's a Neolithic Cursus monument, Hollywood South, and the mapping of it is the central of the blue zones on the right on the map on the right. For those of you who live in Dumfries and Galloway, you will now see why development at Hollywood Village in the middle of there is so particularly difficult. It is surrounded by archaeology including stone circles, cursus monuments, prehistoric settlements, medieval Bronze Age burial mounds, medieval field systems, an Anglo-Saxon and a medieval abbey. The, the Hollywood is completely surrounded by just a small section of the excellent archaeology that we get in the region. And, and I think it's fair to say that uh, I have a run of slides I have ruthlessly abducted from you, which show <laughs> the sheer volume of what you manage the records of. Uh, so uh, if you'd like to talk us through these, since I believe you're familiar with them, I'll click on at the appropriate points. Oh, 
we'll run through them, but, but this was done eight years ago, and I can assure you the numbers are up again. These are the 1500 random find spots. So these are finds that are found in the ground, um, not necessarily as part of archaeological excavations. They can be found by, by people, walking dogs, um, people out, just out for a walk. Historic buildings. These are historic buildings of historic interest that are not listed buildings. There are other buildings that we've already looked at. The bias in the Nith um, and Annan Valleys is, or particularly the Annan Valley, is partly caused by the old Royal Co Commission on the Ancient and Historic Monuments of Scotland, who did some field survey in the early 1990s in eastern Dumfrieshire, and therefore the distribution spread is, as with many of these things, affected by the particular collect data collection techniques. I mean, that's such a common problem, isn't it? That people think these records are consistent, but in fact, they're that palimpsest of where people have worked and what they've done there. But very much so, and, and that's one thing. If I'm sure if I had the time and the luxury and I could clone myself 15 times over, I could cover the rest of the region and, and add a similar number of sites. I'm sure we'd all desire that, Andy. <laughs> listed buildings, these are the three and a half thousand listed buildings that we have. Everything from medieval abbeys um, and stone circles through to World War II munitions factories. 1300 maritime sites, now actually up to 1650 records, of which um, over 1,500 um, are records of a ship's loss at a particular location and for which we have no physical remains, but there are nearly 200 of them that do actually represent physical remains on the seabed. And as you can see, Dumfries and Galloway isn't just a terrestrial entity, it includes looking at the wider historic environment in our coastal waters because one of the primary things to remember about Dumfries and Galloway is that prior to the introduction of the railways in the 19th century, for um, millennia before that, it was very much a maritime region. And the 13,000 archaeological sites, which should now be bumped up to closer to 15,000 sites. All told, quite, quite a lot of stuff then that you have to manage. How, how has that changed over time? So you've, been, you've been in post for over 20 years now. How have you seen that management of that data, that the data resource change rather than just in volume? Well, we, these days we have so many different sources for it. So whereas originally it would have been recorded by the Royal Commission when they did their surveys in the early 20th century, and subsequent notes by people like the Ordnance Survey, who added a lot of archaeological features for Ordnance Survey mapping. Um, one of the things that you mentioned now is the growth in the 1990s and subsequently of commercial archaeology once the necessity for archaeological work in the development process was introduced into law. And that's led to, to a considerably larger number of on-the-ground interventions. It isn't just local societies and universities doing research work in the region, which might have been two or three or four sites a year. There are now four, 40 or more archaeological activities, mostly in the development field, but including projects like the Galloway Glens and the North mm -hmm. Coastal Path, who are doing work within the region. So in terms of actual on the ground field work, there's been a tremendous increase. Mm -hmm. Aerial photography has always been a source of data and continues to increase and the drier weather that we're getting means that we are getting a larger number of sites beginning to appear. Um, there's also the use of, of technology now. We have the ability to go in, there's a crop mark site for a farmstead um, out towards um, Loch Maven Way. You, you don't have to know where every site is from, Andy. I'm getting quite annoyed. I know, I don't need to know where they all are. Um, that one's particularly interesting because I've not only got the aerial photograph of that, 
but elsewhere in my collection, a lady who lives half a mile away has sent me a photograph from her bedroom where you can see the banks and ditches reflected ah. in the height of the crop growth. And we actually have a photograph of the crop with these waves going up and down uh, because where the ditches are, the soil is richer and the crops grow taller. And therefore we actually have this reflected in a view from the ground. So that site as a crop mark reflects itself in more than one way. And, and the, the public do add to the record like that as well. Um, but no, we, we have area of trouble. We now have map digitization. There is a wonderful project called the Dumfrieshire Archival Mapping Project, which has worked with landowners to actually help digitize the estate maps that were drawn up before the Ordnance Survey started doing national mapping. Um, and they are now provided, a lot of them are provided online via the National Library of Scotland. And they've done so well in Dumfrieshire that they are now expanding outwards, moving into the Stewartry and further into Galloway. But that's a tremendous resource that we, that we didn't have access to previously. These were rolls of maps held in, in vaults by estates or in dusty cupboards. Um, that are now being brought out uh, and examined for the first time. I'm just going to come in here, sorry, with a little plug for the Galloway Glens there, um, because the uh, Dumfries Archive map on, Mapping Project is one of our proje uh, partner projects for another of our projects. Um, and if you missed, if you saw the talk with Archie McConnell, I think that was a couple of weeks ago, I think that was excellent, that was one of our first online events. If you missed it, it's on our YouTube channel now. Archie is very engaging as well, um, and we're planning lots more work with him coming up, I think possibly guano based in the future. So that's <laughs> something to look forward to. We're trying to encourage Nick not to use profanities in the title. I, I'm, I'm fascinated to see, I should now insert a disclaimer, be, be wary of adverts being inserted, popping <laughs> yeah. up uh, through this talk. It's a paid uh, channel. <laughs> and, and going back to those historic maps, Andy, I take it uh, that they can be a resource to find sites that we weren't aware of. That it's, it's not just an exercise in understanding past landscapes, it can uh, illuminate the current landscape. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, uh, as part of some development work, I was looking at, oh, I was looking at an old map um, of Wigtonshire and I spotted the depiction that's um, Blaz, looks like Blaz map. On, on the left hand side, but I noticed that um, at Torhuski there was a castle depicted. Um, and I used to live in Wigtown, I wasn't aware of a castle existing up there, and it, it piqued my curiosity. So I examined the aerial photographs, and as you can see from that, there's a particularly dry section um, which actually is lying in a bog in a bend in the, in the River Bladnock. Um, and I could see that on the ground that there appeared to be something. So I went out there, I'd, I'd given a lecture in Wigtown that afternoon and, and I went on to see what it was. And I found this. This is a manor house that was in use up to the 19th century. It's actually built in the very early 18th century. Um, the front of the manor house that you can't see is done in the neoclassical style, but round the back here, all those windows use the roll mouldings and the carved stonework from the tower house that was shown on the 1654 map. So when the rebuild came in 1704, they've kept the carved stonework, but because it wasn't in the new neoclassical style, they put it all around the back. But you don't expect to find previously undiscovered 30 foot tall, intact to the eaves, leads houses. Um, the local fishermen knew about it, the farmer knew about it, they all assumed that we, the wider archaeological profession, knew about it. But the Royal Commission missed it in their 1911 survey. The Ordnance Survey had, had marked it down, but not as an antiquity. They said the cottage was in use until 1907. Uh, and I just walked down there to see what it was I'd seen. Um, and it's one of those genuinely jaw-dropping moments, you think, how did we miss this? So yeah, there is archaeology out there still to be found. And do you see any new resources 
coming over the hill, so to speak, that could improve our ability to identify sites such as that or, or similar? Well, yes. I mean, the, um, just last month, the Scottish government has released LIDAR on its spatial data portal. LIDAR is like an airborne radar um, and it can see down through vegetation and can produce a map of the ground underneath it. So there's a group of um, sheepfolds just on the western side of Use Water, um, northeast of Langham. Uh, and although you can see bits of these sheepfolds on the ground today, quite frequently they're obscured by bracken. So you could go there um, in the summer, uh, late summer, and not be able to see them at all. Whereas the LIDAR strips the vegetation away and makes, makes them and the, um, all it, very easy to actually identify the site. And I may have 27,000 records already, but I can see uh, Dumfries and Galloway was involved, the council was involved at a very early stage in the LIDAR for flood management. And outside of the central belt, we have one of the most comprehensive LIDAR coverages in all of Scotland. And I would be surprised if I didn't get at least an additional 2,000 or more sites from it. Um, no, I, could, I could well imagine, I could well imagine, Andy, it's, it's an incredible resource LIDAR and to have good resolution available, open to the public to use is absolutely. awesome. Now, that's a lot of information you're gathering, a lot of information you think you can gain about the historic environment. Now, I presume it's all being held for a purpose, and I appreciate that perhaps the main role people know many regional archaeologists for is to provide specialist support to the local planning authority. Is that an aspect of the role for you? Yes, when I initially started, I was the Historic Environment Record Officer so I was responsible for creating and maintaining and curating the database and the map, well, the mapping system. Um, and then the, uh, the opportunity came five years ago for me to progress up to the um, role of council archaeologist. Even in my early stage, I was involved in providing responses for government agri-environment schemes um, and in forestry development. And now part of my role is to look at the planning applications as they come in. Sometimes I'm consulted by colleagues for specialist input, but because I'm aware of the incomplete nature of the record, I also look at the planning applications list every week as it comes in to see if there are any sites where there may be historic environment issues that aren't immediately obvious to a non-specialist. Uh, but it's not only the formal planning role in the planning department and giving specialist advice to planners. Um, for uh, There's also material that doesn't fall directly into the planning system. So mm -hmm. I, um, I will do material related to forest plans. Mm -hmm. um, the Forestry Scotland contact me over every single felling license and every single woodland creation scheme in the region so that we can input into into that. Uh, utilities companies get in touch when they're proposing to do works in the region. So you have an incredibly broad role then to, to, to give guidance on land use, change, development, changes in the agri-environment uh, uh, approach to, to Dumfries and Galloway. When you're then looking at uh, where there are impacts or there are need for more information specifically in the planning process then, is, is that something you do? Do you go out and uh, deliver uh, archaeology to support developers? Um, no. Um, they, given, given the size of the archaeology service and, as I said, 40 or more interventions going on throughout the year, much as I'd love to, um, no, there, there is a duty, um, the, the planning system lays it out quite specifically that the, the burden of doing, undertaking the archaeological recording falls on the developer. 
um, it's following the polluter pays principle. So um, I will respond to a plan to a planning application and I may put in a planning condition that requires the developer to engage an archaeologist for a program of work. That could be recording a historic building, it could be a watching brief where an archaeologist is on site while the works are taking place, it could be excavation of an entire site prior to development works taking place. There's a range of responses and one of my duties is to make sure that the amount of archaeological work that is requested is proportionate to the planning application. Um, it always has to be justifiable. I have to be able to justify it to the councillors um, and to committees for it, as well as justifying it to my managers. I have to, um, but, but you, you have to make sure that you're not asking for a disproportionate amount of work for something that's only going to be a tiny impact. But at the same time, impacts can be very significant. The, the one on site on screen now was a potential housing development on a field at Newbridge, just north of Dumfries. I asked for a 10% evaluation. So an archeological company put in excavation trenches over 10% of the field to determine the presence or absence of archeology. span They uncovered a prehistoric settlement that we, we were aware of up at the top end of the field and we were able to characterize that um, with excavation of two roundhouses and part of a palisaded settlement around it. But they were also able to demonstrate that there was no archeology span in the rest of the field. So if the developers wanted to go forward, they would then be able to come up with a housing scheme where the archeology span was left in open ground undisturbed and the housing development could then proceed in areas where we were quite confident there was no archaeology. So that's quite a common structure is it where you're you're seeking to get that balance between protection or uh, enabling development in that sense by recognizing how it can go forward with the least impact on that sort of non-renewable finite resource of our uh, archaeology. Absolutely. Um, so in, in a lot of cases, it isn't a case that, that there is a site and it has to be excavated. It's one of the crucial things is that if developers get in touch with the archaeology service early enough and discuss the issues or potential issues, then we, we have what we call mitigation by avoidance. If we know where the archaeological resource is, and we've done an evaluation that quantifies it and lets us characterize it, then we can come up, we can work with the developer to come up with an appropriate scheme that is going to reduce the damage. Um, and that's one of the things, if you build up and build over a site, that's not an archeological issue because the archeology span is still there underneath what's going on. It's if you dig down and remove it that there are issues. So it's the case of, of trying to come up with, with the, the development that enables the developer to develop. So planning is not there to say no to development. Planning departments are there to enable the right development in the right place. Um, and archaeology is one of those issues that will be taken into account. Now, I don't, I don't want to uh, sound sound uh, crabby at this point, Andy, but as, as a fellow archaeologist, I do like digging things, though. Uh, and mm. as, as we both know, there are circumstances where, uh, through the best will in the world, unexpected discoveries are made in the course of works that necessitate excavation. Uh, would, would this be one of the fine examples of it? That, that is a fine example, and it's a doubly fine example because that is um, an Anglo-Saxon hall or an Anglian hall laid apart, which is marked by the long trenches, um, and that's laid over the top of a slightly earlier British hall marked by the line of post holes down the, down the centre of it. But that's a planning condition that we put on our own council. The development work there was for the construction of the new Lockerbie Academy. Um, and 
the archaeology service put a planning condition on Dumfries and Galloway Council because we were aware at the time of the potential for Bronze Age burials. And lo and behold, the site did turn up the Bronze Age burials that we expected. But it turned up this Anglian Hall, which is one of only six of its kind known in Scotland. It turned up a long Neolithic Hall that we were completely unaware of. It turned up the most stunning and well-preserved uh, late medieval corn drying kiln I've ever seen in my archaeological career. So, th so there was a considerable amount and, and the archaeologists kept coming back to the council saying we have more stunning archaeology, we need more money to do more work. And the council came back to the archaeology service and said is this justified? And we had done site visits and we said yes these are nationally significant finds and it is the duty of the council to ensure that we that we do this to the best possible standard. And which which is great to see that both uh, the council was ensuring that they were reacting fairly and appropriately but also living up to that responsibility at the same time. Yes. And I suppose more broadly you must see a whole wave of works going on around uh, the Dumfries and Galloway area and I suppose one of the questions must be are, are you able to keep up with uh, the scale of work necessary and the scale of you know the the resource being generated? Yes mostly um, the day-to-day -day development management work um, is, is relatively easy to keep on top of. The, the hardest problem in development terms within the region are dealing with wind farms. On the whole, they have very little direct impact on archaeology on the ground because we do considerable survey and desk-based work in advance of them and they can make sure that turbines and other things aren't where they need to be. But at the same time, they are such tall structures that they have um, visual impacts or they have impacts on the setting of a wide range of historic environment assets up to 10 kilometers away from them. So whereas this, the case on screen at the moment was uh, housing development in Dumfries on Friars Venel, um, mm -hmm. which not only revealed the 18th century cellaring, but actually turned up when we went even lower down, actually showed up some of the terracing where the monks of Greyfriars Monastery had actually landscaped the hillside going down to the River Nick, which was something we were previously unaware of. Um, and this is, that's the, um, again, the council um, having archaeological works undertaken when they did the works on Burn Statue Square at Dumfries, where the, the surface was lifted and a whole series of filled in cellar structures and so on were recorded. And this is, this is an example of a historic building recording required. There, uh, this is a site up near Del Swinton, up the Nith Valley. It's a barn, but it has a number of phases of activity to, to it. It's seen alterations um, and the whole farmstead has changed over use. So because we have no issue with the building being repurposed and redeveloped, we would actually encourage that because it's keeping a historic building in use and not allowing it to fall into a ruinous state but at the same time we will frequently ask for recording of the building before any further alterations take place to record its last use as a buyer before it becomes a workshop. Well it seems very reasonable it's about capturing that record that narrative of these structures before more change happens. Now you've touched upon things beyond uh, construction and development that you get drawn into and and your knowledge is, is uh, uh, accessed to help improve such as forestry and landscape change. Now from my work with Galloway Glens and their community archaeology project Can You Dig It? I also see that you have a really strong role in community projects. Is that is that something that's consistent across the region? Absolutely. Um, the so the, the, it's, it's part of the role of the, the council is supporting the Galloway Glens project. 
But in terms of the can you dig it elements, because that's an archaeology and fieldwork one, then I, I help to provide input into that. I give access to the historic environment record. I can bring my knowledge of the archaeology of the region, um, the depth of archaeology gained over the last 30 years, to actually help when it comes to, to broader things like decisions on which projects should, we could take forward, where to go looking for further data, mm -hmm. um, being able to put you in touch with Archie and say, this is your man to go and see for any maps. Um, but it's not only Galway Glens, I have another project I'm connected with on the North Rins Coastal Path where we're, we mm -hmm. now have a coastal path route round the, the Rins of Galloway um, and that also has an archaeology component to it, which will include the, the survey and partial excavation of, of a Brock site, uh, recordings in a graveyard, uh, and monitoring the condition of 20 monuments around the coast, looking at potential impacts of coastal erosion, but also impacts from tourism, where we have earthwork sites that are frequently visited because they're promoted on tourist routes and to see whether or not the creation of informal footpaths by people walking in a particular direction because they want a particular view shared is actually create where, whereas we think we're promoting the site we may be ca causing problems for the site at the same time so we we have an ongoing five-year monitoring program for a number of sites around the rims as well and like the Galloway Glens, this, this, this is a starting up project, but it involves a, a significant amount of public participation. In terms of getting people out doing archaeology and caring for monuments, uh, I take it that's something that you're, you're very keen to see, regardless of whether it's within a larger archaeological vehicle or just a small activity. Absolutely. They, they, don't, they don't have to be massive multi-million pound projects all the way up and down the Glen Kens. The example shown was, came up um, with the then Forestry Commission Scotland as part of a woodland management programme where I'd been offering advice and it was on the outskirts of Dumfries Airfield and I pointed out that they had a number of perimeter bunkers uh, and the Forestry Commission thought that it would be very good to actually excavate and clean up the bunkers that were buried underneath bracken and soil and so on, um, and to actually select one of them to clean up and produce interpretation for, because it was close to one of the well-known public, public paths. And the local air scouts got involved because it's a former RAF done free site. And that was just a small project. It was a day out with a group of young people who were interested in the site um, and uh, sponsored by the Forestry Commission. And we went out and revealed one of the, one of the bunkers that guarded the perimeter of the airfield. There are five more in the woodlands, which will be considerably harder to find, but this particular example has now been, has now been cleaned up and, and made much more publicly accessible. So it, it's everything for, from, big projects that run over a number of years down to supporting community projects that may just run for a day. I thought this all sounds very organised and structured. Projects, uh, development planning, uh, records. I'm sure that a, a man with your knowledge uh, uh, gets uh, uh, chased for ex surprise discoveries. Is it fair to say that uh, you, you get random phone calls about things that, that you didn't know were coming. Completely. Um, the, the random phone calls are what make the job interesting. I mean, in, in 2014, uh, you get, I, we got a call to, from some people who said that they just, they had a small holding, an organic small holding. They'd just taken some rare breed pigs and one of their pigs had been rooting around a rock and uncovered a whole series of prehistoric rock carvings. Um, so we went out, I went out and recorded it. Uh, absolutely random, you, you couldn't expect that at all. And, and not an official archaeological technique, I believe, rare bead pigs. Um, rub, yeah, rub, rubbing pigs is not a known archaeological technique, but I'm adding it to the repertoire.
Uh, this is um, a 10th century gravestone found by two gentlemen walking their dog in the particularly bad winter of 2010-2011. The dike behind them round the old graveyard at Hodham had partially collapsed and they were walking past it with their dog when they noticed the stone with some carving on it. They examined the collapsed section further and found the second piece. We're still missing the third piece, um, which should have a cross head on it. But it's a very fine example um, of a 10th century grave slab from the Anglian Monastery at Hodder that literally fell out of the wall. Dog walkers are responsible for so much, uh, uh, truly. Dog, dog, dog walkers and farmers are, are absolutely the... That's um, a very nice Neolithic axed, comes from Borrowdale in Cumbria. That one was actually spotted by a, a farmer from his tractor ploughing a field who thought that stone isn't the same colour as my normal ones and pulled his tractor over and, and picked it up. And it's not always stones. Not always stones. This is uh, an enamelled, yellow and red enamelled Iron Age harness mount from Ward Law overlooking Calavrock. And again, spotted by a farmer from the cab of his tractor. It's, it's only six, seven centimetres long. The fact he spotted that shiny in the sunshine after 2000 years is, is frankly amazing. And, and there are some slightly uh, more nationally famous things you have been uh, souped into. Yes, I, I got a call in 2014 from, from the Treasure Trove unit in Edinburgh, uh, who said that a metal detectorist had found um, a Viking horde, apparently, of, as they said at the time, 22, 22 arm rings and ingots and a cross. Mm -hmm. um, so I got permission to go out there and ended up excavating the Galloway Horde of some 107 pieces at least, ongoing and still counting as we empty out the Carolingian vessel, um, which is the largest Viking period horde found in Scotland since the Scale Horde of 1858. Which is, a very is, good afternoon at the office. Yes, uh, uh, staggering. I mean, in all of this, I, I think back to, to where we started and, and where your career started. And I wonder, do you have time for your research in all of this? Because you're supporting others, you're helping others, you're being reactive to situations. But is, is there time for Andy in this to go out and do? There is a bit. Um, it's, it, it's, it, it involves taking holidays. Um, yeah. <laughs> The only, the only time I can actually do research work is to actually take holidays. So um, I've had a research exploration ongoing at Burns Walk, where we, it, did, it initially started with metal detectorists doing a targeted survey, then led to a series of targeted excavations to determine that the metal detected signals that we got were verifiable on the ground and ended up discovering the largest cache of lead sling bullets found anywhere in the whole of the Roman Empire. Uh, you, you can't really ask for more than that, can you? No, I mean, I, I, I think in all of my career, I have been genuinely exceptionally lucky. I've worked with some world-class and internationally renowned archeologists I've worked on some stunning sites and I'm now in a region that just gives and gives. The archaeology of Dumfries and Galloway, as I consistently say, is absolutely stunning. Jaw-dropping from time to time. Uh, I think I've been very fortunate in my career to, to get to where I have done, to actually achieve the ambitions of a naive 14 year old all those years ago uh, and exceptionally blessed to to be working where i am when i am thank you andy i think that's a lovely point to end on and pass back over to helen to to, to quiz you from the audience yeah. <laughs> well i would just say i think that we're very lucky to have you andy as, as a resource for the uh, region we've certainly very much appreciated it i know as on can you dig it for your role in the steering group um, it's been fantastic to have that kind of wealth of experience to draw on. Um, we've had some great comments and chat. I hopefully it hasn't been too distracting for you guys. Um, I don't think there's 
to, oh no, there are some questions coming in now. What I will just say is that people have been brilliantly sharing links to the museums for some of the finds that you've put up, um, links to the museums. And I think it is important to stress that as well as Andy, we've got a fantastic museum service in the region. And, we, um, we, we have a fantastic museum service and they do work very closely with me. Uh, I do, I do help the museum service out with identifying finds that people bring in. Um, and they, one of the delights of my job is seeing an email from a museum with an attachment to it, because I know it's going to be something else I've never seen before. Um, and who knows how many rabbit holes it's going to lead me down. <laughs> Yeah, so well worth it. Look, I actually, I have to say, I had underestimated just how good the museums are for, for local history, which sounds ridiculous because what else would they be for? But um, we've got a couple of questions coming in before we finish up. Uh, Andy, what do you think of the influence of time team on the practice and popularity of archaeology, good or bad? <laughs> or good and bad? I, I think it, time team is, is very much both. I think it was tremendously helpful in bringing archaeology to a wider audience. Um, I think that they covered a wide variety of sites around the country, so, so they made it understood that archaeology was everywhere and for everyone. Um, there are some issues with it. I think that in some cases they raised unrealistic expectations, certainly for developers who thought that you could just go in there and do a site in a weekend. Um, <laughs> So, so um, and, and because it's very much done, I've done a lot of work for television and it is structured to be what looks good for the viewer and makes a good programme. So a lot of the behind the scenes work isn't shown and a lot of the interminable troweling away at a surface for days on end without finding anything, um, it, it also doesn't show up. One of, one of the things I was told very early on was that you could tell you were, you'd become a real archaeologist when you were more interested in the features than you were in the finds. Um, and so I, I think Time Team was a mixed blessing, but I don't think archaeology would have had as high a public profile, and I don't think it would have got into the legislation and the planning process in the way it did without the mainstreaming that the time team did for, for the yeah. subject. Yeah. Opportunities to volunteer from CAT. I mean, obviously, I hope, I hope you do all know that there are plenty of opportunities through Can You Dig It, a bit limited this summer, but Historic Environment Scotland are very uh, flexibly extended the terms of our grant. So we're, we're still going to get two summers in with Can You Dig It. It won't be this summer and next summer. It'll be next summer and the summer after. So that's great news. But Kat was wondering if there are any opportunities to volunteer with the county archaeologists, Andy. Uh, relatively limited at the moment, we um, because there's um, there are only two of us, one of whom um, is only on a temporary contract for the moment, and because we take undertake so we take undertake very little excavation work. There is a a lot of mundane behind the scenes work um, in, involved in helping to build up the record. Uh, there are still some of those boxes of uncatalogued finds that were there when I arrived 20 years ago are still sadly still there because I've not got around to them. Um, my, my current assistant Louise is doing a sterling job in going through the boxes of excavation reports and, and the, the ones that's been submitted digitally and helping to integrate those in. So there is, there is background work that can be done but we do so little field. Oh, we do so little field work um, as a as a as a council body that that I would generally steer people in the direction of projects like the Galloway Glens and North Rins Coastal Path. Mm. Or if I'm doing things like Burns Walk, but one of the offshoots of Burns Walk is that I should have been digging this week at a site near Lockerbie working with the Estelle and Liddesdale Archaeological Society on a site I discovered from an aerial photograph and which is actually a spin-off from the Burns Walk project um, and involves the core group of the Burns Walk team through their local archaeology society have now got money as part of some wind farm um, local development money 
to enable us to actually go and investigate this site and find out whether or not it is part of a system of Roman communications um, links heading north from Burns Walk up the Annan Valley. So I should have been doing work and, and if I had been doing that, the Burns Walk project would have put it on its Facebook page to go out there and engage with volunteers. But, but much community archaeology is undertaken by local groups or by local projects. And, and I would generally steer people in their direction. But if people do get in touch with me, that, and they do, that's what I tend to do with it. Brilliant, thanks Andy. I think Steph, has that potentially answered your question as well? What advice would you give to somebody who wants to get more involved with archaeological digs? I would say if you live in the Galloway Glens area, then uh, get onto our Facebook page and our mailing list. Are you sick of hearing about the Galloway Glens yet? Um, but as Andy says, there are other local community ones if you're not in our area. So but maybe the other, go. The other thing is that it is now becoming much more normal on commercial development led excavations to actually have um, a public facing section of it as well. So, so there are some of the larger scale, longer development led projects will actually have public facing elements and it may be possible for volunteers to get involved with those. So, and a lot of the commercial units um, like Rathmill Archaeology who are a commercial unit but are delivering the programme for the Galloway Glens um, or AOC who are a commercial unit but are delivering the archaeology element of the North Rinse Coastal Path. They free, a lot of the commercial archaeological companies also do um, uh, community-based archaeology and so it's always, always worthwhile writing to your local units and saying are you going to have opportunities coming up? What evidence of Roman occupation is there in Galloway? <laughs> Go! <laughs> um, absolutely, absolutely loads of it. The main Roman road that predates the A-75, the main east-west Roman road, goes through Glenlocker. We have the fort where it crosses um, uh, the fleet at Gatehouse of Fleet. Um, one of the other roles I do is take a number of guided walks, both for Newton Stewart Walking Festival and as part of Scottish Archaeology Month. And I've actually taken people on a guided walk behind Anwath at Gatehouse of Fleet onto the physical remains of a Roman road that is visible on the ground. We've got traces of the road, we've got a Roman fortlet at Bladnock, we've got the Roman road passing um, westwards. For those of you in the region who ever drove through Dunragget before the bypass went in, the road is very, very straight there because it's actually built on top of the Roman road and aerial photographs show the quarry pits in the woodland down the side. We know the Roman road goes as far as Soul Seat Lock and it then turns up heading northwards through Castle Kennedy and presumably runs up the eastern side of Loch Ryan um, where we suspect that we have a missing Roman naval base um, in a mess in the area is where we think we should be looking for it, but we've not found it yet. Very succinct, Andy. Very impressive. <laughs> right, I've just about finished mistyping my own website address, but I've uh, put that in just for people's interest. Um, and I'm so glad that we've had, I've, I've absolutely loved the chat. I've absolutely loved Andy's um, and Tom's discussion there. I hope you found the format interesting and useful. If you have got any feedback, this is all new to us and we've done it on a bit of a sixpence. So any feedback to myself, helen.keren at dungal.gov.uk, always appreciated. But um, thanks for being a really lovely audience. And um, thanks to Andy for that. Absolutely fascinating. I have such yeah. a varied career and I am delighted that you are the regional archeologist like you said you wanted to be. <laughs> and, and if anybody does find anything, if anybody knows of sites that they don't think we've got. Um, the Archaeology Service does have a map, uh, mapping system available online to see where sites that we know are, but you can just get in touch with archaeology at dungal.gov.uk if you've got any finds that, uh, we, we had a chap recently um, who had inherited a bronze bowl from his father um, that came at, that his father found while fishing at Bentpath near Cannonby. It's currently the National Museum because we think it might be a 2,000 year old Iron Age bronze bowl.